Hi, and good morning from New York. As the scale of today's Nudge Talk shows, the behavioral insights movement has been incredibly successful over the last decade. We now have a vibrant ecosystem of practitioners, teams, and academics building on each other's work. The Behavioral Insights team is proud to have been pioneers of this growth. Over the years since its creation as the first Nudge unit in 2010, the team has created some of the most influential frameworks to drive the field forwards. I couldn't have imagined this outcome when I was co-developing the Mindspace framework back in 2010. But we also know that to fulfill its potential, behavioral science needs to continue to evolve over its next decade. So today I'm gonna to share a work in progress, a manifesto that sets out nine proposals to help behavioral science fulfill its true potential. In fact, we have space for a 10th and final proposal, and we would like you to propose what it should be. I'll tell you how at the end. The first proposal is to use behavioral science as a lens. In a way, the very strengths of applied behavioral science may be holding it back. I remember when BIT was new, there was a pressing need to show results and demonstrate credibility. And that pressure led us and others to create similar processes for developing and testing interventions. And these processes are strong and often produce clear results that are easy to communicate. And they have a lot more work to do. But this very strength can have a self-reinforcing effect that produces more of the same downstream, tightly defined interventions that focus on discrete behaviors by individuals. Behavioral science also has much to say about broader, larger issues in society, like discrimination, pollution, economic mobility, and the structures that produce them. In other words, as Ruth Schmidt and Caitlin Stenger put it, we need to move from thinking about choice architecture to choice infrastructure. Behavioral science should be understood as a lens that improves your view of any private and public action, rather than as a tool we sometimes pick up. Now, this is not a new ambition. It was stated all the way back uh, in the Mindspace report quite explicitly. What we're doing now is answering the increasingly urgent question of what is stopping us from achieving this goal. The second proposal is to see the system. Many behavioral insights approaches are quite linear. They identify an issue, create an intervention, and measure pre-specified changes between point A and point B. The challenge is that behavior often occurs in complex adaptive systems where changes are not linear. We can see this in the way that COVID-19 outbreaks seem to be seeded by a handful of people super spreading, while many other people did not pass on the virus at all. What happens if people adapt their behavior to an intervention in unintended and unexpected ways? So what practitioners should be doing is first understand the type of system they're dealing with and then choose their approach accordingly. When we're dealing with a simpler problem, the linear process works well, but in other cases, it may produce false precision that misses what is actually going on. When dealing with a more complex system, we should focus on setting high level goals or rules for the system, seeking feedback and adapting on the basis of it. And this kind of system stewardship should be a goal for behavioral insights in the future. And a clear follow on proposal is that we need to think more about how and when we use randomized trials. They've been a central part of the behavioral insights approach, but they do struggle with unstable situations and system-wide changes. We need to look closely at the ongoing work on how randomized trials can be made more adaptive and resilient and know when we shouldn't rely on that randomized trials alone. We also need to be humble, explore and enable. Behavioral scientists who succeed in the future will be ones that are humble about their own knowledge, who carefully explore people's goals and experiences and who enable individuals to use behavioral science to achieve their own goals. A lot more here. For example, why I don't use the term irrational because of the mindset it can, be, it can actually produce. But for now, I'll say that we'll soon be publishing our explore guide on how to deepen engagement 
with the very perspectives of people involved in a situation. And as part of being humble, we also need to predict and adjust. Before any experiment, we should force ourselves to make a prediction about which intervention will work best and the scale of the effects. Then we need to revisit the prediction when we know the result to create a feedback loop. And doing this will reduce overconfidence and give us a better understanding of our field and our own abilities. It should be a core practice for behavioral scientists. We should also make replication, not inflation, one of our core tenets. We're entering a period where we have a clearer understanding of the likely effects of our interventions, drawing on a growing number of reliable past studies. To our credit, we no longer need to make the case the field should exist, but we do need to be more realistic about the scale of effects an intervention is likely to have and be willing to let go of concepts when more data shows they do not work. But even if we have more reliable sets of findings about effects, are we able to put them together and use them effectively? Part of the problem is that it can feel like we either have very high level frameworks like system one and system two, or lists of specific disconnected biases. But when does one bias or another apply? Aren't some contradictory? Therefore, a crucial step is to move beyond lists of biases. And alongside the need to identify which findings are reliable, i.e. which work, there's a pressing need to understand how the effects vary, i.e. what works for whom when. Relying on average effects may disguise how some people are experiencing disproportionate harm or benefit from an intervention. And there's so much interest in the potential of data science here. However, the increased use of predictive analytics runs almost immediately into increased problems around ethics and acceptability. A better way forward may be to use data science to identify those groups who are disadvantaged or ways in which an intervention or situation appears to increase inequalities and use behavioral science to help. And we call this idea data science for equity. And finally, we need to build behavioral science into organizations. We think the debate needs to change here. There should be less focus on how an organization should deliberately use behavioral science to achieve its goals, like how behavioral teams are best set up. And instead, we should be thinking more about how to use behavioral science to shape organizations themselves, i.e. how to improve an the way an organization sets up teams in general. In other words, building behavioral science into business as usual. And flipping this focus provides a route for behavioral science to achieve both greater scale and greater sustainability over the long run. There's so much we can do here, and there's so much more we can say on these topics, and we will. But what have we missed? What should be the 10th principle for behavioral science in the future? Email, tweet, and we may feature your idea. It's been great talking to you. Enjoy the rest of Note Stock. Back to the studio. Stop!